And we're back. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, it seems that, that from 3 to 5 on Fridays is when everybody wants to call me. So, And it causes a glitch. So we've decided Christina just offered up an old uh, phone for us to use. So this won't happen again. Anyway, I don't know where I left off, but I think I turned this thing inside out. And I was, sh oh, okay. So I was showing you all the places that you could pull it tight. Um, this down at the bottom, the casing at the bottom, is something you'll be doing on your cap. And that will allow you to draw it in um, so that it looks like this, right? And the there's also... I told you there was the additional one here. And then this one, too, also has, because it tends to be a bigger cap, it also has a drawstring right there at the band, which is something you can do as well. Again, this is a fitting thing that allows you to have more flexibility in how the cap looks on you. This particular cap is really beautiful. Turn it right side out again. It is a very tiny... Um, cotton diaper weave. I actually have a piece of fabric um, that's literally identical that I would like to reproduce this with. And then the fun part about this cap, which is something that's not in the other caps, this cap has a ruffle that is basically a um, seersucker. So it ha it's been woven so that it gets these tiny, tiny little pleats in it right along with the ruffles and seersucker actually existed in the 18th century and was woven in that manner they explain it as being drawing it up to get these tiny little um uh gathers within the fabric so that it caused this ripply effect um so that that's my first cap and again date wise your guess is as good as mine. It is all hand sewn, um, but beyond that, I can't tell you. So that brings us to the next one. And these, I'm pretty sure are 19th century caps, possibly Regency period. Very easily could be Regency period. Um, this one, it's just gorgeous. It's a sheer cotton window pane. It's a little bit delicate. So I'm going to be very careful how I put it on here. Okay, lady, your bun is not cooperating. <laughs> Hold on, you guys. She's so, she is so light that she kind of wants to dance all over the table while I'm trying to dress her. All right. You get an idea here. So this one has the, the small call and the very large band. It has insertions here. This is a kind of a netting that has um, a um, stitching over it to create a pattern. Again... This could be early 19th century, easily, um, because it has that little high piece where your hair, if it's in a bun, it would sit about right there. Her bun's in the wrong place. You see the bun's coming for a little bit further back in the Regency period, so it would be about the place that her hair would be. Um, it also has this center back seam, a center front seam and a center back seam so that it creates this wonderful little back here that comes up the nape of the neck and then goes into the bun again. Now this one is, as I said, is a sheer cotton um, muslin and then it has a very fine muslin um, gathered, it appears to be gathered, um, ruffle. One of the things, some of the things that we will talk about, and I mean, you guys, the quality of the stitching, I'm going to hold this up. Can they see that? Mm -hmm. Can they see the edge of it? No, because you're here. I'm too close? Yeah, you're not. There yeah. we go. 
so you can see the edge of the stitching, how teeny tiny that is. I mean, the fine stitching that are, is done on these caps is just really beautiful. Teeny, teeny, tiny stitches, very fine thread, very fine gathering, very fine fabrics. Now, does that mean that all caps were like that? No. This tends to be the, the what I'm finding with the caps that I have. And, of course, like I said, I think a lot of them are probably Regency dress caps or day caps. Um, but you see typically pretty nice stitching on caps. This other cap that I had just showed you is actually an opaque fabric. It is... You know, you can't, you can't really see through it. It's a heavier cotton. So this would be a hard wearing cap, something you could wear daily. Has anybody got questions? Or are you guys answering them all? How did they, oh, someone asked how they saw, saw all of this in candlelight, but Christina's already answered it. And how'd she answer it? She said that natural daylight. Yeah. Yeah, they, they sewed by day. This, okay, this one, again, I'm going to hold it up kind of close. It has this beautiful insertion lace. It's, again, a very fine cotton muslin. It's shaped exactly like the other one, so it's the sister to the other one. Um, actually, it's shaped just slightly different, but it's the same concept. So probably from the same time period. And I'll put her on. She might fit a little bit nicer. Need to move her. You're just having fun playing with your cap. I am having fun playing with my. I haven't done this before where I've put it on a head. And I wanted to put it with hair, although the hair is in the wrong place. <laughs> uh, so it's frustrating me now. But you can see the, the really deep band of these um, so that you're getting that. You've got your front curls. You've got that smooth hair. And then you've got that bun that sits about right here. Uh, and then little tendrils. And so, of course, you can get your little tendrils back here, which would be very pretty. Um, and these would have been worn during the day. This one again, and it seems to be pretty typical with the ones that I have anyway, is that they are hemmed, the ruffles are hemmed on one side with a very teeny tiny narrow hem, and then they are either rolled on the other side or again hemmed on the other side and then whipped to the flat of the band. So here's a good question. Are the sure. caps sized to one person's specific dimensions or is it one size fits all? It's not necessarily one size fits all. Um, you have leniency. For example, I, I just played with this because this was worn by Christina earlier and here's where it's open to for her the back of her head. It would be more like this for me because I have a very small head. Um, that The very first one that I showed you that had the, um, the drawstring in the band, like at the, the join of the band and the cull, that allowed you to gather the band up a little bit so that you could also shape it a little more to your head as well. Um, also, and I realized that I wasn't going to be able to do it just by straight YouTube. I, ha I got some images together, which I'm thinking I can probably just upload them as a, just one post with a whole bunch of images and then put it into my, what's that thing called up at the top where you keep it for Instagram? Collections, I think they are. Highlights. Yeah, highlights. I can 
keep it as a highlight so you guys can look at them. But I came up with a few images that are that are time traveling for the 18th century um, that show basically both of these caps. And you can see where some ladies have them, you know, very tight fitting to the head and others, they're loose, you know. So I don't know that it's necessarily that they're fitting them just an exact way. Um, would you make the cap bigger? If you were wearing it over like a really large hairstyle. Yeah, you're going to have to. You're going to have to. These have been built. We, we patterned these to go over normal hair, i.e. you're going to bring your hair up, put it in a bun or what have you. Um, you're, as you would for a day cap, you might have it. You might have some height in here and it would sit on that, but you're not going to have a large hairstyle. With this one in front of you, um, is the ruffle the same fabric as the rest of the cap, or is no, it different? No, it's different. Just like the other one was different, this one, this one is a plain cotton uh, muslin, like our cotton muslin that we carry, and then it's a pretty decorative cotton muslin, uh, sheer checked muslin, as the same as the one that I showed you previously, which is same styling. That one is a very tiny sheer checked muslin, and then it has a plain muslin um, uh, ruffle. Now, does that mean that you can't mix and match or, or that you can't do all the same? I think you probably could, but this is the way these came to me. You know, that that's what I'm saying. Um. Fern Linter's asking if Martha Washington style cap would need to be bigger. Um, and I would say it depends on which time you're talking about with Martha Washington. Exactly. 1750s or 60s Martha Washington's going to have a much different cap than 1790s where those big those right. portraits with this you know much larger hair. Mm -hmm. um, um in regards to wearing your cap when you go out of doors under your hat, would it would you keep your cap on? Say your day cap when you go out of doors? Yes. Typically you see that you see lots of images of caps, them with hats on. Um, and so that is a common way to wear it. Um, and wearing a hat out of doors is pretty common. Again, because during the 18th century, having a clear complexion was very important. So you didn't want to get a sunburn. And of course, a lot of our art comes from England where they have a lot of rainy weather and a lot of pale skinned people. I don't mean that in a negative way. I just mean it from the standpoint that you're not going to, you're gonna be protecting your skin. You're gonna have a lot of inclement weather. So when the sun does come out, you're gonna be very susceptible to burning. And were caps ever made in other colors other than white? Okay, so when I have seen colored caps, I've seen them from a standpoint as being an over cap. In other words, an additional cap that is worn over a white cap. I have seen it in French art. Um, I've seen a bit of Dutch, I believe, and that's it. It seems to be very regional and possibly, you know, it could be f folk dress related, I'm not sure. Um, but it's not something where you would go out, let's say, for example, and find a pink muslin and make a pink muslin cap. You don't see it. At least I haven't seen it to this point. I won't say never say never. So, well, obviously there's something funny going on. I never get to read all the stuff that you guys are saying. So, um, Fern Linter said that um, their kids asked at Plymouth why they wore hats. And we're told it was so that their brains didn't boil. <laughs> that was probably um, Daniel. <laughs> what do you want to bet? Yeah. Um, is another good reason for them to be white is so that it's easy to clean them? Yes, absolutely. Um, because the linens or the whites that were being worn, those were regularly cleaned. Um, so they could use they could well i would i'm not real familiar with lots of 18th century receipts but the type of of cleaning they could boil them um they could use lye with them it wasn't going to impact the fabric and it wasn't going to take the color away because you got to remember that a lot of dyes would have been more fugitive than our commercial dyes that we have today 
And um, these are the ones that we're looking at here. Are they linen or are they cotton? They're cotton. But linen's also a possibility, correct? Oh, yeah. In the 18th century, you do see uh, linen caps. Again, cotton, fine cottons are coming from India. England does not have the capability of producing a really fine cotton until you get more towards the end of the century, Um, and even then. But they're able to produce a linen cotton, which is quite similar to some of the nicer cottons coming out of India. Um, But the really fine cottons that are available, um, let's say to us here in the colonies, are probably coming from India. And I'm sure that you may see uh, caps out of cotton, but you're going to definitely see them out of linen because that's the common textile. Um, Johanna's asking, was wearing a cap in the 18th century a fashion choice, a modesty choice, both? Um, someone else mentioned hygiene. Yeah, I think part of it was hygiene. Christina's probably going to chime in on this one. Um, I think it was hygiene. Uh, to keep your hair clean and protected because, you know, the world out there was pretty dirty and nasty. Um, And so a cap would have protected your hair. Um, Certainly they're not going to be washing their hair every day like some people do now. And they are trying to protect their hair. Um, They would have worn them from a fashion standpoint too. It was just a common accessory that everybody wore. Um, and typically your hair was not, so the cap would have protected all of it. Unlike in all those movies and TV shows where, you know, the minute they, they, they get outdoors or anything exciting happens, the caps come off and the hair is down and. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No. I I remember, I remember as it. Yeah. Yes, we can clarify that. Yes, we can clarify that. Um, say when say she, what you're clarifying in case they can't hear Christina right. from all the way downstairs. Christina said, can we clarify that I'm talking about predominantly white people, okay? White 18th century people. Um, when mostly you get Europe, into... English. Right, mostly English. When you get into um, the... BIPOC, what we call BIPOC community, there are different things going on. There's different ways of caring for the hair. There's different ways of protecting the hair. Um, So they're not necessarily wearing caps the same way your white English community is wearing a cap. So, and I'll be honest that the images that I put together are all white English people. Um, But I will go look now because now you've challenged me and see what I can find so that we can talk about it a little bit. Um, This cap is definitely got the very tiny little call piece here. And again, it could be Regency era, it could be later. Um, I've actually had, I've got a friend who is a lace expert and I've taken close pictures now and I'm gonna send them to her to get her um, take on the laces as to whether they're handmade or if they're uh, machine made. If they're machine made, you know, it could date them much later. It could even be something, you know, that's a a nightcap, an Edwardian nightcap for argument's sake. I don't think so. I think they are earlier than that uh, because again, they're all hand stitched. Um, Nothing is, is machine stitched, but then again, caps, are a little bit difficult to make by a machine. I don't know if any of you have ever tried, but I don't think I'd want to try making one on a, on a sewing machine. Um, this one has lace inserts as well. And I've seen these type of lace inserts in baby caps, which is kind of neat. This one too has an interesting element to it, and I'll show it from the front. Whereas this portion, which goes here, is flat and all the ruffles are on the sides. That is weird Mm -hmm. looking. So I don't know what type of hairstyle that would work with, you know. Um, It would be worth an experiment to find out as Brooke pops her Diet Coke. (laughs) Oh no, I just did a commercial, I didn't mean to. (laughs) I knew you'd do that. (laughs) 
<laughs> it's fine. Um, yeah, somebody. But, it's possible that some of these caps we're looking at are could easily Civil go into War. the 1830s. Yeah, or even later, Civil War era, mm -hmm. um, depending. So this one, again, has that high little top knot, and it has a beautiful, this has a shaped back. Um, it also has, yeah, it's got the drawstring. It just drawstrings. looks funny on this head. Like, the hair's not in the right spot, so. I know. Blah, blah. It, yeah, she looks like she's going to kind of looks like a nun's habit um anyway this one with that shaped back it's also got a drawstring in it as well um but it's got this pretty shape that comes up like this again to show off the nape of the neck and this one is just made out of a very fine cotton muslin and then has the lace insertion it also has added cotton tapes um, so that it can be tied under the chin. And these are uh, original to the piece. They don't look like they've been added later. And it's really cool because this is such a very fine, fine muslin. And the, um, the, the uh, words, it's Friday afternoon again. Uh, um the 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 channels that the the um the cording casing. is in a casing thank you words the casing is so tiny it's like two sixteenths and they have a very tiny what you would call a a thick i would call it a, a thick thread running through it to tie it up it's like a cord more than yeah a it is a cord uh it is a cord um, and it's a very narrow, um, uh, twisted cord. So. Oh, that's it. Nope, wait, there's some more hiding. Okay, these are two. Who knows? No idea. No concept. Very pretty. Enjoy. <laughs> this one is real simple. It has... Just a plain band with a ruffle on it. It has insertion lace. It has a thick tie to tie under, which kind of makes me think later, like maybe Civil War or even later than that. Um, it is a very fine cotton uh, muslin again, and it has been lightly embroidered. You can see here, it's very sweet. And it has a double layer of, um, I think this is the one that, hold on. No, I lie. Never mind. It's got, <laughs> it's got, I'm pretty sure this is a machine made lace. So again, probably making it later. Y'all like my, my head? And now are most of these caps, do you think English or American? Or do you think any of these perhaps are have no idea? European? They came, they came from America you know, as far as being bought, um, they came from a collection. I don't know what, who the collection was. Like I said, I got them secondhand. So, and the other person, I don't recall them telling that they had a lot of information about them when they got them. One question that came up earlier is mm -hmm. um, generally how many shifts and caps would someone have? Mm. Our favorite question. It is a favorite question. And it's really hard because a lot of times for us to be able to document that, we have to look at things like wills and inventories, or sometimes you see it in diaries. But oftentimes things like underwear aren't necessarily documented. There was some, there was a, um, there was, oh, it was many years ago, somebody was doing something about stays and saying, we don't think women wore stays because they're not showing up in wills or inventories. Well, of course they wore stays. But it was one of those things that for whatever reason, I guess it was like, okay, um, if we were giving our clothes away as part of our estate, would we count all our underpants? I don't think so. So it may have been equivalented like that. I don't know. I really don't know. Someone says caps are hair underwear. Hair underwear. Yeah. I mean, they're very practical. 
but they're also beautiful. This is the last one for you guys, just because it's pretty. It's very simple. It's got a really cute shape to it. I'm wishing now that I put her bun further back because it's just not working with my caps. It works for the 18th century caps, but not with my caps. Did hair always have to be hidden um, for modesty reasons or could it be styled and fashion visible? Well, you see portraits all the time of hair, you know, being dressed high and beautifully uh, accessorized with beads and, and um, what do you call them, ostrich feathers and all kinds of stuff. Um, but hair down, you do see it. Like if you look at Cries of London, things like that, you sometimes see hair down. But I think from a practical standpoint, it's not practical to have your hair down because it's going to get dirty faster. Yeah, it's usually, if you're not wearing a cap, it's dressed in some way. Yeah, dressed it's dressed with up. And decoration. Has, yeah, yeah. All right, so for this cap, we are going to move a little closer. And you're going to hand it to me. Okay. And now you can, and now you can talk about it. Oh, because we're going to talk about the... Uh, the stitching. Oh, I'm going to talk about it? Yeah, you're talking about oh, the cap. You looked away, and I thought you were the Christie. It is tambour. So that's why I said that, because I thought Christina was like, yo, this is a tambour, tapping away and saying this is a tambour cap. But yes, it's a tambour cap. Um, that's something else that, that we are planning on teaching. Um, that will be a Miss Christina class. But tambour was a really common way of producing embroidery. Um, it could go very quickly. You often see it white on white um, work. You see it in caps. You see it in uh, handkerchiefs. You see it in aprons. You see it in dress gowns sometimes uh, where they're doing tambour work. And it's actually an industry. So they're producing it commercially in a sense if you want to it's not probably the right word, but they're producing it as an industry. It's not something that somebody, some little old lady sitting home and doing, but it's a form of decoration. Um, so this one was tambored, um, and it's cotton on cotton, from what I could tell. And it's really interesting as far as its shape goes, because it's, again, this shaped band. There is no ruffle, and then it has... Uh, plain and then gathered right here in the top piece truthfully I think what we really need to do is we need to get a wig and we need to like figure out the hairstyles for each one of these caps to figure out how they would have been worn I think it would be cool and it might even give us clues as to what what era the cap is from but this is a little tiny cap um, it could be early you see caps like this in the uh, 1850s um, so it could be early. I mean, 18, 1750s. Oh, God, I'm in the wrong century. Um, you see caps like this in the 1750s. So who knows? It could be very early. Wouldn't that be cool? So, so that's all my caps for today. I have other things too, but. Well, let's talk about some of the fabrics. Um, there were a few people earlier who asked about um, if they could use certain fabrics for making their caps. Mm -hmm. What were some um, of the fabrics? They were wondering about the um, the corded linen that we were selling earlier. Right. Uh, we do we do have a little bit of it left. It's uh, in pieces, and we're putting the pieces up next week. Um, so it will there will be like another yard or two of that. But yeah, it it tends to be a kind of a stiff linen. Yeah. Um, it's sheer. But it's stiff. Um, if you wanted to try washing and softening it to the best of your ability, you might be happier with it. But it's not fine. Um, what about our dimity? If they the dimity, you could. The dimity reminds me in a weight and a um, weight-wise and texture-wise and that kind of thing of the very first cap I showed you, where it's going to be more of an opaque fabric. In fact. Um, we can't see that. Oh, you can't see that. No. Okay. Um, 
Helga is still wearing her dimity under petticoat. Um, and so it is opaque or semi-opaque once it's washed. Um, but it doesn't have a real heavy hand. So a day cap, you know, something really sturdy that you'd wear, let's say if you're going to reenactments, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's a possibility. Do you want to show yeah. some of the fabrics? I can. We're at that time. Yeah. So I can show you. Sorry, you need to move. You need to move your the head out of the way. Head, move. Bye. Um, this is my cambric. Yes, no, that's the cambric. Is what what number is on it? It's got the wrong stall number. What number that. is that? Six five one seven. That's not cambric. Oh. Cambric is seven six is the yeah. last digit on it. Yeah, I'll go grab it. Okay. Um this is is this the this isn't the old Japan Japanese. This is the new one. Because this feels like the old stuff. Um that is the old stuff. Okay, we're we're down to this one. <laughs> this one I know <laughs> is what I what I say it is. This is a cotton muslin that we have in stock that has a very fine, I don't know if you can see that, a very fine stripe in it. Basically, it's an extra um, warp yarn that's producing a solid stripe and then it then you have like a shear between it, but the, it's teeny, 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 tiny, microscopic little stripes. It's very pretty. The stripe runs with the selvage. Um, it's, it's pretty sheer which you, I think you can see too. It's fairly sheer. Um, it is soft, easy to work with. I think it would have some body, you know, when it, with lots of nice little tiny gathers um, for the ruffle and for the call. Um, it would have some nice body to it. And if it didn't, of course, you could add a little bit of starch, but this is available on our website. And that is in the list that uh, Brooke gave you. Um, that's on the front page. There is also, the final one would be the silk gauze, and she's going to bring these other two to me, too. You can do a cap out of silk gauze. Um, if you wanted to take these up a notch, like especially the, the rounded eared uh, one, the bat band, um, and make the call bigger to handle hair, etc., you could also make it out of a sheer silk gauze. You do see gauze caps. Um, you see them with lace added to them. Uh, you see them with some, um, with various, you know, like silk ribbons. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen any embroidered per se, but that one could make you a very fine cap. But remember that your hair is gonna show through completely. So here's you've got, the cambric. Okay, so then we've got our cambric. Um, um, the question now, both is of our caps were made out of that. The question is silk gauze, not silk organdy. And I'm under we, the understanding that silk gauze is the, the 18th century name. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like we don't use voile or, or organdy. Yeah. Those words up and, and my And this gauze is not... I've seen some silk organdies that are very stiff, and this is not. This is this has got some some drape to it, so it's the quality of it too. You don't want something too stiff. Um, this is our linen cambric. It is a fine linen. It is semi sheer. Um, I made my cap out of it. You didn't make your, did you make your cap out of it? No. Yours is I'm a little not bit sure stiffer. I'm not sure what my cap is made out of. It is made out of a scrap from my, my box of linen at home. Uh -huh. So I'm not sure what it is. Okay. So actually, so this one is fairly sheer um, for a linen. And that would make up a, a nice cap. A nice everyday cap is what I would consider it. I'm getting a pile on my, yeah. on my thing. Yeah. And then... And this then, is the Japanese cotton that we have right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, we had this incredibly 
so sheer cotton and i think that's what that little piece is no that's not the 6440 this is the uh, this is something the, else this is the 5837 this is the indian oh the okay and that's and coming do, back in stock yeah and we do have some, some pieces, pieces of this that okay. i will put up next week okay and what's the song let's see it's 5837 that's the this one with is the clothes a, this selvage. is a regular cotton yeah it's got a pretty selvage edge so if you want to cheat you can use that for your ruffle uh just buy more yardage um, it is sheer. Um, this is one that we have regularly made for us, and I'm hoping that we're going to be getting an order, a huge order, in the next couple of weeks. Um, the virus has not been kind as far as getting things. Um, the one, the Japanese that we have now is not as sheer as the original was, but will make a very nice cap. Um, it's got some nice body to it. It's semi-sheer. I don't know how much you can see my hand through that. Um, but this one is lovely, too. They're all on our website. They're all linked in the list um, that Brooke has put up. Yeah, I put it in the um, live chat. And once we're finished with the live chat, we'll put that in the description for this chat and the first half of this chat. Right. But it's also on the front page. The mini chats. Of the website. We have had many chats. And then there's my little plastic bucket that was given me <laughs> that has some of the little odds and ends that you'll need. Well, I know like, you like baskets. I like baskets. Um, you're going to need fine thread. If you're working with linen, you know, we've always said that. We have our little charts that say use with the fabric. If you're going to uh, sew with cotton, Sew with either cotton or linen. If you're gonna sew, uh, if you're gonna sew linen fabric, use linen thread. If you're gonna sew silk, sew with silk. Um, we have a very fine silk thread that's really great for the silk gauze. Um, it will allow you to make teeny tiny little uh, gathers, etc., and very fine stitching. For your linen or your cottons, you could use either our 100 over 3 or our 80 over 2 or go and get yourself a good quality cotton um, sewing thread at the sewing store because we don't carry it. Um, this is actually the rule. This is a quarter inch. I, oh, I grabbed the wrong one. I'm okay. sorry. Just pretend it's narrower. Show I'm the gonna, one off of my cap. Okay. I'll do that. So, nope, because you used wide stuff. I used, that's the eighth of it. Nope, this is eighth. So this is the eighth of an inch mm -hmm. tape. All right, it's very narrow, very fine. If you want to really, if, you, you're, if you're fussing and you've decided you're going to make, you're going to do the bazillion stitches per inch uh, cap of the century, you can even use, like, get our 30 over 3, linen um, thread and it's thick enough that it can be used as a cord so a fine cord so <clears throat> you're going to need a little bit of that you're going to need an awl uh, to punch your little um, eyelets that are going to go into that casing that your uh, that your tape's going to go through and then of course you're going to need wax if you're using linen you're going to need obviously your thimble and then good needles. And um, these are our lin these are our sharps, our number 10 sharps. I would suggest those or the number 10 milliner needles, which are even longer. They do have very tiny eyes. So if you're like me and you don't see well anymore, you might have to go with the number 10 betweens, which have a larger eye. But they're a very short needle. Uh, but you're probably going to want a little bit longer needle for this project. And, of course, you'll need your wax. And that's all the little bits and pieces. No, it's not. No, it's not. We have some larger bits and pieces. We have the new linens, oh. which someone just asked about if we have some new linens new, coming new stuff. into stuff. Well, we've got, we've got four things up right now, more to come, lots more to come. Because, like I said, we've been in... in website purgatory for the last two weeks and so we've gotten a little bit behind we have a brand new shirt shift linen up um, it is our soft white so it's not the brighter white and the soft white just for your edification they did not do what we do with fabrics nowadays they didn't have the ability to whiten like we do now so white was never truly 
white. It was never optic white. It was a soft white. Um, so this actually is more historically correct when it comes to linen. Um, so we do have a new shirt chiff linen in, which is very nice. And that was, in fact, Brooke had said, don't forget to talk to them about bits and pieces. If you have pieces left over from your shift, you may have enough that you could cobble together a um, cap. So don't be too quick to like, you know, oh no, I don't have fabric. Take a look at what you've got in the way of your leftovers. Uh, we made a note there that you typically, if you want to piece everything, you can put together a um, cap out of an 18 by 22 inch piece of fabric. So it can be done. We also quickly sewed, thanks to our stays live, we quickly sewed out of our narrow ticking stripe. Um, but we have a white ticking stripe in now that's a slightly wider one. It's about three quarters of an inch, which you could also use for stays and tickings and um, things that, that need a fairly sturdy, sturdy linen. This is a very sturdy linen. It's really lovely. Um, you can use this for men's breeches, waistcoats, linings, um, utilitarian needs, as I said before, tickings and bolsters, um, writing habit, a white writing habit would be Ooh, really cool. That'd be really yeah. nice. Yeah. So that we have, and I am working on getting the narrower back in too, but it will probably be in more of a, a half bleach or a natural. Um, we also got, we, we had one blue that came and went. <laughs> we we had have two blues, actually. We had two blues that came and went. And we have another blue that we put up, which is what I call a dark royal. It's a really pretty color of blue. And this one is um, lighter weight, so it's better for petticoats, uh, for gowns, for jackets, men's waistcoats, children's clothing, linings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and of course, indigo, you know, we've talked about that before. It's so common. And the final one for today, and I'll have more for you next week, is we got, had a butter linen in, a butter colored linen. It was beautiful. It was a medium weight. Um, yeah, it was a medium weight. And this is a little bit lighter. Um, it sewed very quickly. And I asked if I could get more. And I got some more, <laughs> which was lighter. And when we started processing it, because, you know, we bolt everything here, uh, we discovered that it had a problem. And let's see if I can find the problem. I can. About every 18 inches, you see one, two, maybe three little tiny. Can you see that? Yep. Little tiny, tiny grease spots. Or at least that's what I think they are. So... It's not on the edge, it's scattered throughout. We are selling this at $8, $8 a yard. $8, yes, instead of 14. Yeah, $8 a yard. It's a lovely Irish linen. If it weren't for that spot, it would be, you Perfect. know, $14 a yard. Yeah. So if you have things, if you wanna try getting the spots out, if you want to over dye, if you want to use it as lining material, if you just don't care because your persona doesn't care, uh, and if you're, you're doing, like me and you're going to spill things on it anyway, you know, why not? yeah. If it's working clothing, if you're doing if you're doing a, a working persona, um, you'll already be pre dirty. So <laughs> that's it for our fabric. So were there any more questions before we finish our day out? Um, we're currently having a discussion about tiny needles right now, so I'm tiny not sure needles. we'll give them a moment. But um, to discuss their tiny. But needles. you said we have some more linens coming next week. We have mm -hmm. um, the light Saxon blue is coming back, mm -hmm. and we have some black linen, um, and then sorry, there's some more questions, but I don't think they're for me. Ah, oh, they wanted to know if the, the company would make it would has offered to make it up for you to you for yeah that's why i'm able to sell it to you for eight dollars so, yeah um they're wondering if you're gonna have any new stripes coming in um i'm working on that is there any are there any particular things you guys are interested in 
because that will help to help me choose what I want to purchase. Um, also, are you going to get any more natural straw hats? The natural straw hats will not be until January. They're being manufactured. So, um, What about kerchiefs? There are going to be new kerchiefs coming in. Actually, not new. Reprinted kerchiefs and one new kerchief will be coming in on a slow boat. Um, and the slow boat's been getting here. <laughs> Again, unfortunately, I'm, I'm going to get tired of saying the virus, but the virus um, has caused a lot of disruption with um, manufacturing, with um, getting things, getting product. Um, it's just been a mess. But we're hoping um, that we'll be getting an order into us in the next week to two weeks. And there will be loads of new handkerchiefs up um, or reprinted handkerchiefs up. And our cotton uh, muslin will be back in stock. And uh, hopefully, I, I will then in the next week or two, and then by October, I'm hoping to have some brand new handkerchiefs, new designs for you. So working on it. Are there any printed cottons in stock right now? There are none right now, but those will come for October. I mean, we have the gold spot. Yeah, we have the gold spot. Um, and that's really it. Everything else has sold out. Um, we are, I am going to do the three reprints that we promised you. And those will come to you hopefully by October 1st. That's my goal. That's what I'm hoping happens. Um, and then there'll be some new things as well. That's what I'm hoping for. So they also want to know about wool. Do we have any new wools coming in? Ooh, yes, and, we and, do. Yeah. Kit, Kat, some... Kit Kat Stish especially was asking about wools. Ooh, yeah. you're going to like some of the colors I'm getting. Yes, and I believe they are just, they're, they're on their way now. Yes, I'm going to have, now they won't be up right away, um, but I have some new wools coming in the beginning of next week. I also have some wools that are over there. Um, what do, what, what we do have I some got? wools. That they'll yeah. be going up next I've week got, as well. We've got the Charleston Green yeah, and we've got, got the Dark Chestnut. That's right. Do I ha now did the yeah the uh, the Saxon blue is already up right? The Saxon the blue. Isn't there a there's, Saxon blue? There's blue? a lot of blues. I'm not sure which blues are. <laughs> I are have here. a lot of blue. Yeah, but blue sells. Um, they, like some dark purple wool. Um, someone's asking about matter red wool or linen. The matter red is a is is a hot one. It's hard to come by in wool. I have a very difficult time finding it. Believe me, when I find it, I have it up on the site. I am getting in some mattered colored linen, but it will probably be at least a week or so. So, And there was one other I was going to ask about. They have, there's a lot of questions about what you're going to get in. Um, <laughs> oh, uh, Lacey Good. loves the shirt you're wearing. Oh, it's a, it's a dress. Thank you. I like it, too. I love the colors. Um, they would like to see some more, um, some stripes, um, especially a, uh, like a white and gold stripe. White and gold. Is that possible? Do you mean gold as in shiny gold or just, just gold the color? Whoever asked that. Yeah. I need to know which because shiny gold I don't think I can do for you, but I can do a linen and a gold and a white probably. Oh, and they'd like to see a, another blue on blue stripe. Okay. So you're not tired of my blues? We love blues. They're so common, well. you know, in the 18th century. Blue, everything. Um, I've considered getting, I may be able to get more of the dark blue that has a couple of different colors in it, stripe. Um, and I'm going to look into trying to do that. And I've, I've got some things that I've been offered, so I just need to, to pony up and decide what would be best for us. And we have one final question. Yes. Any idea on when our in-person workshops will be open for registration? Okay. I'm making the announcement here, and it will be followed up. At this point in time, we are definitely not going to be doing any workshops in September or October. Um, this decision is not made lightly. It's based on the fact that we don't feel that it's safe, 
especially because of the type of environment that we have to have in order to do an online work, I mean, to do a hands-on workshop. Granted, it's a very small group of people, but those people are in an enclosed, a small enclosed space for two and a half days, breathing each other's air, even if you are in a mask, and you're touching each other because that's how we do our workshops. Um, and you're touching each other because that's how we do our workshops. So with that said, I feel that it's risky and I'm not comfortable with it. Um, so we have made that decision. We, November is not tabled yet, but we'll see. I won't make any announcements. My little COVID thing is going to stay up on the web for the time being. Um, what we are doing, what we are working on, and uh, Christina and Brooke have put their heads together as well, and we are working on bringing you some things virtually. So these will not be, um, these will probably, I don't, they'll probably be on a separate platform. Uh, is what we've talked about. And they will be, um, we will have to charge for them, but they will be virtual workshops. Um, so hopefully you guys will, that will help. And one, one final question. Yes. Will there be any more changeable silks coming soon? Oh, I, I, I've got some small bits of silk in stock right now that aren't up on the web right now. They are not changeable. And the changeables you're looking for are our sarce nuts. I mean, not our sarce nuts, our lute strings, which I have not been able to source again. Um, but I'm working on it. So I will never say never. <laughs> I, I loved them when we had them. Uh, we had them for a very long time. Um, I... Potentially, we'll have them back in stock at a future date, but I'm always looking for silk. And like I said, I've got a group of silks that'll be going up. They're very limited quantities, just so you're aware. These silks are also not clear taffetas. They are taffetas that have occasional slubs in them. And this basically is correlates with 18th century silk that was not... Um, that was not unusual. So if you look at 18th century silk, if you look at large expanses of it, you will find occasional slubs in it. So it's very similar to that, but it's not like our clear taffetas that you know we manufacture today. So that's it. All right, I think that's all we have time for this week. We have gone over a little bit, but. Oh, well, I missed you guys very much. Brooke missed you, Christina missed you. Um, they are going to be getting to work next week so that we can bring you that first part of CAPS on Friday at 10 a.m. Don't forget to tell your friends about our sew-alongs. Don't forget to tell them to subscribe to us and to watch our YouTube channel. Uh, we really appreciate uh, you getting involved um, with what we have to offer, and we love hearing from you. Um, please stay safe. I know it's still continuing to be kind of a hot mess out there. Uh, and we will see you next week. Now, I will not be doing a live prior to next Friday. We'll have our first live on Friday at 10 a.m. And at that point in time, we'll talk about our next live. All right? Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye.